Last week we have finished, last week we have finished the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. And uh, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is actually the central point of this book is because right from everything that Paul was sharing with us concerning the doctrine. He brought us to the point of the spirit. What does it mean to walk in the spirit and not to walk in the flesh? And today we're going to move on and chapter 9, 10 and 11. It's all about Israel now. We're going to see powerful and mighty wonderful things about Israel, what God has spoken about Israel and what God has for Israel. But we could take valuable examples for ourselves because the Word of God is the Spirit. We want to make this place ready for the Spirit of God. No flesh. Just God and His Spirit. Amen. Amen. And it's going to happen. And I believe it is happening already. What we see on our Shabbat services, it's wonderful and amazing. And what's going to happen tonight is also will be wonderful and amazing. So chapter 9, we're going to start with these words. I tell the truth in the Messiah. So Shaul is talking again, Paul. I'm not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed for the Messiah, for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaining adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. All these things were given to Israelites. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, the Messiah came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Now those who don't believe that Jesus is God, here's the proof. It's written plainly. It says, Messiah came who is over all the eternally blessed God. In my Bible it says God. So at the beginning we see this wonderful interesting introduction again as Paul by the Spirit is shifting from one subject to another because as you understand every book in the Bible doesn't carry the same message. It's, it's moving from one place from one subject to another but they all combine together. They fulfill in each other. They fulfill in each other. Okay. It just building up, building up, building up because God is not a God of confusion. He is the God of peace. He is God. So when he teaches us, he is building us up. So we're not going to be confused. We're going to be built up. I want to be built up on Jesus. I want to be built up. I am the house of God. The temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to be built up by Him. As the Bible says in Isaiah. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Amen. So here it is. We see that Paul began to speak something. That is very sorrowful. And grateful. Grateful. Uh, uh, grateful in his heart and he said this is what the sorrow is all about that everything that God has given to my Jewish nation they have the only thing they miss is the Messiah the very one that was supposed to come and fulfill everything he says I wish I was separated myself from God for my countrymen but it's not possible he says I wish so that they may see and they may be saved. This is how it works when God enlightens your eyes. All of a sudden you wish that everybody would see the same thing what you see. Experience what you're experiencing. Amen. And just realize what it says here. 
as it is written that everything was given to the Jewish people. Absolutely everything. And the last installment that, was, that came from God was God himself, our Messiah. Everything was given to them. This is why he had such a grief. This is why. But then it, he goes and says this. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. It is not. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. This is a very interesting point. A lot of people will disagree with everything that will be, you know, that we will see here. Because, you know, if you try to please men rather than God. Did you know that? Something that God struck me last night when I was I, I kind of meditating on today's Bible study. And actually, and, and God, period. And God spoke to me and he said this. If you or anybody else make their ministry more important than God it's an idol I know we can cry for our nation we can cry for people we can cry for their sins and I know that we can actually you know intercede and everything else and have that burden as Shaul had he has expressed a great burden and 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 as he said grief in his heart he says the spirit of God is witnessing but he has never made this an idol to him, to him, to himself. He has never. He always kept God over all that was happening. God was number one in his life. Regardless of what. So if you're going to put our ministry or even any nation higher than God. And will be... That will be more important to us than to please God. We are idolizing our ministry. For God so loved the world that he gave, his son, he gave his only begotten son. God loves the world. Absolutely. But the priority that God is explaining to us is that God is still number one. You can love your neighbor as yourself. But you have to love God more than yourself. Are you listening? If you love God, yourself more than God, you idolize in yourself. This is how critical it is to understand how jealous God is. Think about it. And his jealousy is burning not because he is selfish. Not at all. Because he says, your life depends on me. If your life depends on me, don't hang on to me. Just don't, don't just hang on to me. Some people say, hang on to God, hang on. I say, grab God and hug him and keep him like that. Don't just hang on. Surrender everything you have to God and walk with. Him. Amen. So we understand that he was crying for Israel, but there's something powerful is, is, is been said here. And he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee, yet he was not afraid to speak the truth. Because the truth comes from God, and we know that God doesn't lie, and we could speak the truth. You can always, always speak the truth and not to be afraid because the truth will set you free in somebody else. The truth is always truth. So don't be afraid to speak what the Bible says. Because God is always right. God is always right. And look what he said. He says, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. He said, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Can you imagine what he says? He is disqualifying right there some people from being Jews. This is why a lot of Jewish people, when they read Paul, they hate him. They can't stand him. They don't like him. 
Because it is through Paul that the Spirit of God unveils the heart of God toward this nation. And toward every nation. Paul was the man of God and by his Spirit he spoke the truth and only. Without hesitation. Yes, we love people. Yes, we love the nations. Yes, we love Israel. Yes, we help Israel. But Israel cannot take the place of God in our life. People that are dying in sin cannot take the, their place in, of God in our life. God is number one. Hallelujah. So he says plainly that uh, not all Israel that are of Israel. And now we're going to, I want to explain this very carefully today. Why he says this and what is it all about. First of all, pay attention to what Paul said. And it's very important. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. To him, the word of God was more important than anybody else. And he said by the Spirit that the word of God will stand forever. It's going to be there. Heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will never. We cannot, by our action, disqualify the word of God. Never whatsoever. Because... The word of God is not under our authority. We are under the authority of the word of God. You cannot change the potter. Clay cannot change the potter. The potter changes the clay. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And just remember this. That he is not. Paul is not going against Israel at all. He says my grief is continuous. My sorrow is continuous. I wish I could lose my own salvation. If it's possible for, for, for the Jew to be saved. So he loves them. He was one of them. And yet the truth of God was more important to him. He says let's see what's happening here. And then it says. Not are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Wow, that's another thing. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Now what flesh God is talking about here? It's not that flesh right now as we very much talking about against these days. He said the flesh of Abraham. He said they are not all the children that came out from his bosom. It means not every Jewish person that came from Abraham's lineage is the child of God. Because he says, he says, it's not according to the flesh. If my children were born from me, it doesn't mean if I'm saved, they could be saved automatically. It's not by genetic involvement whatsoever. It's only through God and only by God and always. So not everybody who calls themselves Jews or Israelites are the children of God. Not every Israelite, the Bible says, is of Israel. Wow, that's interesting. So in Isaac, your seed shall be called. In Isaac. In verse 9, it says, for this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Jacob, for the children, the Bible says, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the, what, election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I have loved, 
but Isa I have hated. What is the purpose in all of this? How does God decide these things and why? I'll tell you this chapter is very difficult. Because we all want to hear encouraging, good, powerful words. This chapter is a bit destructive to me. Now I want to show you something else. Before we go on any further... Just compare something with chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I want you to see the difference. In chapter 9, the only thing what Paul was saying is expressing his grief in his heart for what has happened. But he never mentioned about salvation at all he was speaking as a regret regret he was speaking only as a regret but in chapter 10 he began to speak something like life to it again he says my brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God that all Israel that they might be for all Israel that they might be saved now hope begin to shine again do you see that he says in chapter 9, I wish I could lose my own salvation for one. It's not possible. And what shall we do? And he began to explain why it's not possible. But then in chapter 10, he says, my prayer and desire for Israel that they might be saved. So chapter 9 speaks about something powerful and crucial stuff. Let's read further. Or even let's go back and see something, the comparison, what he has said. First of all, let's talk about Isaac a little bit. Isaac eh, represents the Messiah. Abraham was required to bring Isaac to the Mount of Moriah and bring him as a sacrifice. And God didn't take it because he would never accept any sacrifice but himself. Jesus came and, di uh, and did it. And by the way, do you know where Jesus died? On the same spot where Isaac. Abraham brought Isaac where 2,000 years later the real Messiah will die for our sins this is why Isaac became a seed now also if you understand God said to Abraham he says not the children and actually Abraham didn't have any children by the way he was childless when he was 70 75 80 85 and so and and Sarah was barren and then God began to speak to Abraham. He says, I'll make out of you children as the sand on the shore. Imagine what Abraham was thinking. What was he thinking? 75 years old. Life starts all over again. How could this be? Anytime God would speak our mind will kick in first and we will begin to reason before we're going to get that thing in a spirit. Oh, that's what God meant. So he would think and say, well, my goodness, that, this, is, this is a huge amount of children. It was a promise. God has promised. And actually what he has promised, it's not only about Israel, by the way. It's through the seed of Isaac. As the sand on the shore, it's not only the Jewish people, it's everyone who comes through Messiah. There are people like myself and many other Jews that are saved and born again uh, through Messiah Yeshua. And we are from the literal lineage of Abraham. You have to move from physical to, to spiritual. And if you are not, you are not the children of God. We understand that Jesus is coming back. And in one day, the whole nation of Israel shall be saved. And these are only those that of the remnant. Those that will be alive. They will be saved because in one day they will become the children of God through the spiritual seed who is their Messiah. God has made the difference already. And he showed that difference through Abraham. He says, here's the physical seed. 
And here's the spiritual seed. Now, when Jacob had two sons, Esau, no, 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 one, one, actually, not Jacob, but when Isaac had two sons, one of them was Esau, the other one was Jacob. It was given to Jacob to carry on the mission of the seed. Because God cannot accept two. It has to be one. So God has rejected Isa from the plan. He was not fitted. And God says, you are not going to take that. It's going to be through Jacob. God has chosen that path. God's plan has to be fulfilled according to his will. Always. So God would reject somebody. Put him away. Put him aside. Even sometimes throw him out so that his purpose would be accomplished. Did you know that? Amen. We know that God is a loving and gentle God. But when it comes to righteousness and his will, he will clean the way. I'm not talking on my own authority. The Bible speaks about here. And they said that God said himself, they were not even born yet. But the Bible says that God said that he hated Jake, uh, Esau and loved Jacob. God already set his mind toward one and set his mind toward another. And nothing and no one can change it. It is when God gives the revelation and God opens our eyes, we could choose. But when God is building, we better not get in the way. This is how difficult it is, actually, and how tragic it could be. The Bible says clearly, Paul understood this because God doesn't play with religions. He says, you're going to stick to my plan. Otherwise, you're going to be out of the game. Amen. He says, you're going to have to stick to what I say, to my plan. I have created my plan and nobody, no one will take it. No one will change it. No one will do anything against it. This is why God is so precise. God is not just like, you know, he's not just like a God that you will cry. Okay, maybe I'll have mercy because, oh my goodness, this person is so nice. God has his plans. God has his ways and no one will change it. You will never, never please God by manipulation. Oh God. Oh God. Sometimes we cry to God for our own things. And because we want Him so much, we begin to cry actually. And say, oh Lord, just, just, just give me. God says, no way. I reject this kind of prayer. Because we have to do God's will. Whatever we ask of God, let it be according to His will. According to his will. You know what happened to. Prophet Samuel. You remember Prophet Samuel in the Old Testament. He cried for Saul. He was really crying for Saul. And God said stop crying for him. I have rejected him. What are you doing? You're losing your time. You're wasting your time. For nothing. He says I have rejected him. My goodness, this is a hard message. He says, I have rejected him. Why? Because Saul has rejected God. Amen. A lot of times we're trying to pray for somebody or bring, bring somebody into the kingdom. And you know that this person is blaspheming God all the time. And he has rejected him left and right. I leave these people alone. And I say, let God deal with them. Hallelujah. Do you know that the Bible says that no one will come to God unless, or no one will come to Jesus unless God will take it by his hand and bring it him, bring, bring him to him. No one will come to him unless God will do it. And the Bible says also, when God has rejected Esau, because he was not in his plan. He was actually 
trying to destroy God's plan. He was on the way. And of course, when Esau grew up, he was the guy that's full of himself and on his own mind. And according to the tradition, Isaac was supposed to pass on the birthright to him. And he would carry on. But God says, no way, you're not going to do that. I have rejected him from his birth and you're not going to touch the, the boy. But Isaac did not understand that very well. He was already moving by tradition. He is the firstborn and I'm going to lay hands on him. So what God did, he blinded him. Isaac became blind. And his mother, Rachel of Jacob, she says, you know what you're going to do? I'm going to dress you up like him. You're going to smell like him. Your father will never see who you are. You come and tell him that you are Issa. That he may bless you. Otherwise, Isaac, being so stubborn in his religion, will never do that. It will disobey the will of God. So God had to blind him to do that. Can you imagine? Sometimes God has to do something to stop us to do wrong. God will do anything to, 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 to fulfill his will. By the way, it's, it's, it's so important to understand that God will do everything. Everything. If people are on his way, he will do anything. You know what he did with Pharaoh? He just hardened his heart. He says, come on boy, let's fight. Let's see who's going to win. I'm going to harden your heart. You're going to be so hardened against my people and myself. And I'll deal with you for that. He gave him a few chances. But then he says, I'm going to harden your heart. If you are like that, let's fight. I'm going to make you angry against me and then see what's going to happen. Then I will just cover you with water and that will be over. Friends, it's in the Bible. And then, of course, Esau was on his own mind and everything else. And he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, being hungry. Jacob was happy to get that as a deposit because Jacob also understood was it, what does it mean to be to receive from his father. It's, it was like a, a real inheritance. I am the next heir of my house. I got everything. But they didn't understand very much the, the blessings that God was carrying on to bring the Messiah was passing on and on and on. They were just the carriers so that you may carry God's plan exactly the way he says did you know why you're here for is to know God's will and to carry on let us not try to mess up because if God did not spare these guys watch out he may deal with us very harshly It's important for us to understand that we carry the blessings of God continually. So, Esau was rejected. He, went, he became an enemy with Jacob. And, and God said further, he says that uh, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. You see, God was building the plan to get that. What he said to Abraham to bring to pass through a nation which, which, which is called Israel from Jacob. When Jacob was changed. And the message was the same. To carry on his message to bring the Messiah to the world. So it is only the spiritual seed that is counted. The Jewish people that they were scattered all over the world. After the beseech of uh, second temple when it was destroyed they were just scattered but the remnant that ac who accepted the lord in that time they went forward and they brought the gospel so the seed was continuing on have you realized that the seed has reached israel and through the jewish people the seed began to spread all over the world so the seed was going on was going forward to reach out to the Gentile world. But what has happened to the Jewish people. For the, to those who did not 
recognized and stood on the way of the Lord. They were scattered abroad. They were just as a sheep without the shepherd. 